new one here, um, our humanist home for Martha, and we'll hear from Bob on Darwin Downhouse and the Missing Link. Um, it's been mentioned to me, or it was mentioned to me just now by Ed. Oh, there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the Planned Parenthood is in the midst of the of a campaign against them called 40 Days or something by a, um, anti choice groups. And they need more volunteers. It's not that they don't have volunteers, yeah, but they, they could use more support. They could use some yeah. yeah, so if you have if you have time, please go visit Planned Parenthood and be a patient escort for them because it's it's a real stressful situation to be a patient and have to go through all that. Um, when in fact you probably aren't there for an abortion. So uh, the next thing, the Texas Free Thought Convention is coming up in November. It's on Saturday the 14th. It will be at the Owls of Far Temple. I don't know where that is, San but um, it's in San Antonio. And it's going to be from noon to 8 p.m. Um, the Secular Center is organizing carpools. And if you make a specific request, you can ride with Lou. He's going to be a driver. Um, if you would like to get in touch with the Secular Center to arrange uh, to ride or to drive, you can email them at secularcenterusa at gmail.com. Um, I want to remind everybody that in January and February, we'll be meeting on the fourth Saturday instead of the third because the, the community center is going to be closed on the third Saturday for both of those months. Um, what months were those again? January and February. So they're going to be closed for Martin Luther King Day and President Day, I think is the other one. Let's see, if we, I see some new faces. If you could be interested in joining our crew, we have some brochures in the back that look like this. And if you'd like to join the humans of Houston, you want to just fill out the part here where you join the American Humanist Association and write our name as your group name here. Um, next, at our next meeting, we're going to be having election officers, and I'm having trouble locating people who would like to be on the committee. So if you'd like to help with that, um, I appreciate your letting me know, or I might have to draft someone. And um, of course, something that's very important that we need to get taken care of. Um, and the good thing about being on a nominating committee is that you probably won't be asked to be an officer. <laughs> so bear that in mind. And with that, I will turn it over to Martha for our Humanist Moment. Good afternoon. Today's Humanist Moment is actually also Darwin, just like Bob's today. Um, and they're all quotes. Correct, Sheila? Yeah. This is my first reading, so bear with me. Um, Darwin on Religion. In his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, Darwin clearly saw religion and moral qualities as being important evolved human social characteristics. Darwin's frequent pairing of belief in God and religion with topics on superstitions and fetishism throughout his book can also be interpreted as indicating how much truth he assigned to the former. In the introduction, Darwin wrote, Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, and not those who know much, who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. The next quote, the belief in God has often been advanced as not only the greatest, but the most complete of all the distinctions between man and the lower animals. It is, however, impossible, as we have seen, to maintain that this belief is innate or instinctive in man. On the other hand, a belief in all pervading spiritual agency seems to be universal and apparently follows from a considerable advance in man's reason and from a still greater advance in his faculties of imagination, curiosity, and wonder. I'm aware that the assumed instinctive belief in God has been used by many persons as an argument for his belief in the existence of many cruel and malignant spirits, only a little more powerful than man, for the belief in them is far more general than in a beneficent deity. The idea of a universal and beneficent creator does not seem to arise in the mind of man until he has been elevated by long continued culture. And thirdly, I may say that the impossibility of conceiving that this grand and wondrous universe with our conscious selves arose through chance seems to me the chief argument for the existence of God. 
but whether this is an argument of real value, I have never been able to decide. I am aware that if we admit a first cause, the mind still craves to know whence it came from and how it arose. Nor can I overlook the difficulty from the immense amount of suffering through the world. I am also induced to defer to a certain extent to the judgment of many able men who have fully believed in God. But here again, I see how poor an argument this is. The safest conclusion seems to me to be that the whole subject is beyond the scope of man's intellect, but man can do his duty. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm the Blue Cane. I'm the membership secretary for this group. So if you would like to be on our email list, not we don't send out snail mail. If you want to be on our email list and you're not, there's a sign-in sheet back there, and uh, that lets me add to our database for Yahoo when you'll get whatever announcements that we have for this group. Um, I also just, I did it late, but there's some temporary name badges back there, so if any of you want to be put on, you can. Um, insofar as the convention that uh, Roxy told us about, they have their own website, Texas Free Thought Convention. You can find out what's going to happen between 12 and 8. I am driving out on Saturday morning, and I'm staying over Saturday night like to carpool with me, you're welcome to come. Just see me after the meeting or call me and we can make some arrangements. Um, the other thing is, um, we are debating, meaning the Houston Free Thought Alliance, on um, whether or not to add the Houston Skeptics Society to our website. Has anybody here had any experience with the Houston Skeptics Society or the Houston Skeptics Meetup? They are one and the same. If you have, I would appreciate it if you relay that to me after the meeting um, to help us decide whether or not they really have the same mindset that the other groups in the HFA do. I appreciate that. Okay, good. Thank you. Let's see if we can turn the lights off over there, too. Should, uh... All right. Um, Sheila and I went to uh, England in 2005, and uh, we took the chance, took the opportunity to uh, visit Down House, which is um, the place where Charles Darwin and his wife Emma lived for over 40 years in the 19th century. Uh, Darwin wrote most of his uh, major works here, including The Voyage of the Beagle and The Origin of Species. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, view of the house that you see when you drive up from the village of Down. And if I can have the next one, very good. This is the uh, view of the rear of the house. And the next one shows the same scene in 1929 when the house became a museum. Um, let me remind you some of the geography of England in the next slide. Um, Darwin was born in uh, Shropshire, the county of Shropshire, which is uh, located in that region, uh, close to the Welsh border. Um, and um, then he went when he was a little older, he went to the University of Cambridge, which is uh, located here in East Anglia. And the uh, Down House itself is um, southeast of London, uh, located approximately in that position. We were staying with my sister, um, who lives in the southwest of London, just about uh, there. So that'll give you some orientation of where all these different things are. The Darwins moved to Down in 1842, and they lived there until Charles died in 1882. But it was kept in the family until Emma also passed away in uh, 1896, and the house has now been restored to the way it was um, mm. in uh, the, the time when Darwin lived there. If you visit the house, you appreciate what a good, solid, practical structure it was, very well suited to the needs of a working scientist. Um, you, you notice this sort of thing um, if you drive around England, you know, you visit all the castles, which are 
surrounded by moats with drawbridges and uh, crenellations on the top. Well, Down House is nothing like any of those things. It's set up for uh, um, a uh, man with a real practical um, and scientific bent. But the other thing that you, you experience when you visit the house is that it, how much of a family man Darwin was. Um, <coughs> let's have the, for the next slide is the drawing room, which is the first uh, place you go into and is part of an addition to the house that was made in 1857, um, which the Darwins needed to accommodate their growing family. They eventually wound up with eight children. And you'll see that the focal point in the room um, is Emma's piano, which is also shown again in this uh, next slide. Um, Emma was quite an accomplished uh, musician, and uh, she often played Chopin's music to the family. And she'd had Chopin, uh, lessons from Chopin herself um, when she was a young woman. So this piano here is over 140 years old. Next slide shows what's known as the old study. Um, Darwin used to work here every morning from about uh, eight o'clock till uh, ten till about nine thirty. Uh, the furniture is all original, things that were donated to the museum by family members. Um, <coughs> Charles used to work sitting in the high back chair there. He used to put a board over the, the arms and, and work like that. And you notice behind him, uh, there are some of his multi-shelved uh, filing system there. And uh, the Pembroke table in the front, this thing's called a Pembroke table, I guess because it's got these leaves that fold up um, on it. Um, that was where he did his working surface. Next slide. This is the billiard room. Um, Darwin used to play billiards with his son, William and George, and the butler, whose name was Parslow. It may seem odd to many people to think of such a famous scientist playing billiards, but that was when he um, uh, used to uh, need some therapy away from uh, thinking on his species theory, as he called it. And the next slide is, shows the dining room. And um, the, it's interesting to notice the, um, the terrines on the um, table at the back there. Let's see. Uh, see that. Those are part of the, uh, a Wedgwood water lily set that um, Darwin's mother, Susanna, ordered from her brother's factory. Um, Darwin's uh, maternal grandma, uh, grandfather was Josiah Wedgwood, uh, founder of the famous family firm. And there's a picture of his other grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, to the left of the mantelpiece. I guess that's, that's him up there. So uh, it's full of interesting uh, family objects in here. Who is that? Who is that pastor, that statue there? On the pedestal there? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Um, it, it, I've got a book that probably uh, might say what it is, but I don't, I don't uh, know. Wedgwood was, was his father or his father-in-law? Wedgwood. Uh, Wedgwood. Um, was one of his, uh, was his maternal grandfather, Josiah Wedgwood was. There was a whole family of Wedgwoods. I have the next one. Now, the grounds of the house are also worth a visit. Um, there's a um, lawn and the flower beds here, which were Emma's domain, and they've been re replanted to um, show her uh, arrangements. So that, that uh, number two on uh, down in this area is the house itself, and there's the uh, the flower bed that Emma kept. 
Darwin purchased land from a neighbor in 1844 to create the wall garden and the orchards, which are number three here. Yeah. So there's uh, this arrangement there. And uh, <clears throat> the kitchen garden and greenhouses are the long narrow enclosure um, walled on three sides back um, in this um, area. And uh, they also owned this 15 acre meadow, number five, where they kept um, uh, horses, cows, and a donkey. And um, <coughs> there's a, this number six refers to uh, what was called the Sandwood, uh, the Sandhill Cops. Um, Darwin used to um, walk through there when he w wanted to go uh, thinking and uh, used to have his dog terrier Polly with him. The next slide shows the greenhouse where he did some of his famous experiments. And number 12, the next one is a view of that pathway through the Sandhill Copse that he used to walk along. Uh, next picture is a portrait of Josiah Wedgwood, the, who we were talking about earlier. Uh, this is his uh, grandfather, um, who his claim to fame was that he discovered a method to recreate the pottery of ancient Greece. Up until that time, they, they really didn't know how the Greeks uh, were able to uh, make that sort of thing. And this is a picture of the famous uh, so-called Portland vase which was one of their early products and uh, laid the basis of the family fortune, really. Um, <clears throat> the other grandparent was Erasmus Darwin, who uh, actually pioneered uh, a simpler form or an early form of the uh, theory of uh, evolution. And uh, Erasmus and um, Darwin's father, Robert Darwin, were both of them celebrated physicians. <clears throat> Next slide is a picture of um, Charles as a, a youngster, together with uh, his sister Catherine. Um, Robert Darwin was uh, very influential in the family and had very strong opinions about various things. He wanted his son to follow in his footsteps and become a doctor. But Charles was um, utterly miserable in medical school because, of course, in those days, um, that was before um, anesthetics were available. And uh, so he didn't exactly take to the barbarity of surgery uh, at that time. And so he was transferred to Cambridge to become a clergyman. Um, <clears throat> next picture is a shows the view of uh, one of the rooms that he had at um, uh, his college, Christ College in Cambridge, um, while he was um, uh, studying. And he graduated in 1831, and uh, it seemed like he was going to uh, have a career in the church. But uh, he got an invitation to uh, join an expedition, a surveying expedition, that was going to um, go down to Tierra del Fuego and the East Indies um, using the HMS Beagle. We can have perhaps the next uh, slide. This is um, the captain of the expedition, Robert Fitzroy, um, who uh, wanted to have a uh, suitable traveling companion. And Darwin uh, was eventually recruited to uh, fill that ray, uh, role. The Beagle set sail on December the 27th, 1831. And in fact, this became the formative experience of uh, Darwin's life. The voyage lasted for five years, and Darwin amassed a huge collection of specimens. He employed a sailor to help him skin and clean birds and mammals, sort and pack shells, plants, bones and rocks, all of which he shipped back to Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> next slide is a watercolor 
of the HMS Beagle. There it is. It's in the uh, Murray Straits of the uh, of Tierra del Fuego. This picture. Darwin took several trips ashore, um, including one 500-mile uh, expedition up to the Andes. And one of the things he discovered in the Andes was marine deposits and remains of a fossilized forest. You see, this is way up in the mountains, way away from the sea. And um, so uh, he, that made him realize that um, uh, the, the history of the Earth was was uh, um, was uh, quite a bit different from what uh, we have been believing before then. But perhaps the most extraordinary trip on the um, <clears throat> on the voyage was a visit to the Galapagos Islands, where he encountered a wonderful variety of animals, including iguanas and giant tortoises. Uh, shown in this uh, picture here. And <clears throat> some of these variations um, were a major factor in causing Darwin to reflect on the possibility of what he called the transmutation of species, how species uh, uh, changed into other species. Uh, another example um, is the, uh, the finches, the little birds that live in the Galapagos who had spread out into the different islands and in the various islands have become specialized to live on different sorts of uh, berries and uh, uh, foodstuffs that were available. Um, <clears throat> when the voyage was over, uh, they all went back to uh, Britain and uh, Darwin took up residence in London in uh, Great Marlborough Street where he lived with his brother, Erasmus, who was, I guess, named for the grandfather. And for a while, he was occupied writing up his uh, journal on the voyage of the Beagle, which he used to work on in the library of the Athenaeum Club, which is shown in the, the next slide here. But Darwin did not enjoy life at that time. Um, he said he was like a new to be living all one's days solitarily in smoky, dirty London. And uh, his thoughts turned instead to finding a nice, soft wife on a sofa. Uh, I can't imagine what he would want a sofa for. <laughs> in a house in the countryside. And the woman of his dreams, of course, turned out to be none other than his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, who he married in 1839 back in Shropshire. So the next slide shows portraits of uh, Charles and Emma. These portraits are both to be seen um, in Down House. Darwin was a very caring and affectionate father, and we see him and his um, son, William. I guess they used to dress the little boys even in women's clothes in those days, in a way. Because by 1842, they found their house in Down Village. And uh, the next slide, this is a picture of Down Village as it was um, back in the 19th century. <clears throat> now, the theory of evolution was already forming in Darwin's mind. And he wrote a preliminary outline of it in 1842. He decided he needed to study the details of a number of species to amplify the theory. <clears throat> and he turned out a detailed study of a much different species, the barnacle, um, during his early years at Down. Can I have a picture of the barnacles? There are the barnacles. You've, you've all seen barnacles on things at the seaside. But um, it's uh, interesting to know that there are a tremendous number of variations of different sorts of barnacle. And, uh, of course, Charles had uh, found even more uh, um, unusual barnacles down in Chile. So all of this is uh, detailed in his study um, in the barnacle book, what he called the barnacle book. Next uh, slide. I guess, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting too far. That was the, uh, 
the picture was from the Barnacle book. Unfortunately, his work on Barnacles was interrupted by the illness and then the death of his little daughter Annie, who's shown in this picture. Annie was very close to Darwin and uh, was a very affectionate child and he felt that he'd never recover from this bitter and cruel loss. She died from scarlet fever and, it's belie and people believed that uh, Darwin's uh, uh, lack of belief in God was finalized by uh, her death. <coughs> he also made a close study of pigeons, <coughs> shown in the next slide here. It used to be a, a, a favorite preoccupation of people in uh, the, the um, 19th century to breed pigeons, domestic, various domesticated animals. And he became quite familiar with uh, the law of pigeon fancying and um, discovered the minute variations that the fanciers exploited to produce the different sorts of pigeons, the pouters, the fantails, and the tumblers. I guess it's, it's rather like the variations among dogs that we see in our day. Um, a major event occurred in 1858 when Darwin received a copy of an essay by Alfred Russell Wallace, which discussed many of the same ideas that Darwin had had on evolution, including the role of natural selection. So Darwin got together with uh, some of his uh, friends and associates. In this next picture, we see him in conference with the, ge the geologist Lyle and the botanist Hooker, who was um, at that time the director of um, Kew Gardens, of Kew Gardens. If you go to London, you, know, you ought to visit Kew Gardens. That's one of the most interesting things to see. So Hooker um, came up with a, a plan uh, of what to do in this um, situation. Um, and he arranged, uh, this hooker again, he arranged for a special meeting of the Linnaean Society at which there was to be presented a joint paper by Darwin and Wallace so that Darwin would not lose his uh, priority, all, all the work that he had done. And then uh, finally the Origin of Species was actually published in 1859. Now the reason, of course, that Darwin had been reluctant to publish it up until that time was he knew what sort of reaction it was going to get, and there was a vigorous reaction, and the book received all sorts of criticism. It sold out quickly, but it also uh, excited a lot of uh, a lot of uh, problems. Uh, next slide is uh, a picture of Thomas Henry Huxley. Um, Huxley was uh, a professor at Imperial College. I was very proud of that when I was a student there. I, I went there uh, quite a bit later, I, I hasten to add. Um, but ha Huxley was known as uh, Darwin's bulldog because he mounted a very vigorous defense of, uh, of the master there. There was a famous debate in 1860 between Huxley um, and this gentleman who was called Soapy Sam Wilberforce. Um, he was the Bishop of Oxford and uh, he was related to um, the Wilberforce who uh, led the fight against slavery in Britain. But unfortunately he didn't uh, believe in evolution. Uh, there were cartoons in Punch. You see the next picture. There's Darwin equipped with a tail. Um, and it says at the bottom, that troubles our monkey again. So uh, he wasn't too well thought of at the time. But after the publication of The Origin, Darwin continued his work. Although he had worsening health with a stomach ailment, that um, still mystifies uh, uh, medical people. 
and people still don't know what the cause of this thing was. He conducted many experiments in botany, uh, illustrated in the next slide here, and uh, experiments on the actions of earthworms. And he wrote uh, several more groundbreaking books, including The Descent of Man, in which he continued his uh, exploration, you see, of the theory of uh, evolution uh, into man himself. And then uh, another famous book on the expression of emotions in man and animals. Here's a picture of Darwin in old age. If I may. This is the um, well-known sort of portrait of Darwin as an old man. He died on uh, April the 19th in 1882, and he was buried in Westminster Abbey among Britain's scientific elite. Now, each time that I give a talk uh, on Darwin, I like to add some, uh, get into some aspect of his life uh, which relates to um, modern times. During Darwin's lifetime, the term, the missing link, achieved some currency in the language. And uh, when his, um, when, uh, particularly when his paper was criticized because no one could demonstrate the missing links between apes and humans. There was a famous instance of this in 1877 when Darwin was invited to the University of Cambridge to receive an honorary degree. Um, <clears throat> there were several accounts of this, including one written by Emma Darwin in a letter to her son William. And so I've asked uh, an English lady that we all know, uh, who's got a nice accent, if she would read this letter uh, from Emma to William. Okay, this is Emma Darwin, and she refers to F, which must mean father. Sorry, Steve. Can you read that? Uh, you need Cambridge, a... Cambridge, Sunday morning. Sheila, why don't you put your phone? All right. <laughs> I'll start again. Cambridge. Sunday morning, November 17, 1877. My dear William, it was a great disappointment your not coming yesterday to witness the honors to F, and so I will tell you about it. Bessie and I and the two youngest brothers went first to the Senate house and got in by a side door, and a most striking sight it was. The gallery cramped to overflowing with undergraduates and the floor crammed too with undergraduates, climbing on the statues and standing up in the windows. There seemed to be periodical cheering in answer to jokes which sounded deafening. But when Ed came in, in his red cloak, ushered in by some authorities, it was perfectly deafening for some minutes. I thought he would be overcome, but he was quite stout and smiling and sat for a considerable time waiting for the vice chancellor. The time was filled up with shouts and jokes and groans for an unpopular proctor, Mr. Black, which were quite awful. And he looked up at them with a stern, angry face, which was very bad policy. We had been watching some cords stretched across from one gallery to another, wondering what was to happen but were not surprised to see a monkey dangling down, which caused shouts and jokes about our ancestors, etc. A proctor was foolish enough to go up to capture it, and at last it disappeared. I don't know how. Then came a sort of ring tied with ribbons, which we conjectured to be the missing link. At last, the vice chancellor appeared more bowing and handshaking, and then F was marching <coughs> down the aisle behind two men with silver maces, and the unfortunate public orator came and stood by him and got through his very tedious harangue as he could, constantly interrupted by the most unmannerly shouts and jeers. And when he had continued what seemed an enormous time, Someone called out in a cheerful tone, thank you kindly. 
At last, we got to the end with admirable nerve and temper. And then they were all marched back to the vice chancellor in scarlet and white fur. And F joined his hands and did not kneel, but the vice chancellor put his hands outside and said a few Latin words, and then it was over. And everybody came up and shook hands. And so that was how he got his honorary degree from Cambridge. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Shea. Well, <clears throat> the missing links are no longer missing. And we've found many examples now of intermediate forms, some of which have been in the news lately. Um, there's an excellent book on the subject by Donald Johansson called Lucy's Legacy. Uh, and this is a picture from the cover of that book uh, in which uh, Johansson uh, admires an Australopithecus skull um, I was fortunate to introduce Johansson at the AHA conference last June, and then Sheila and I took him out to lunch. Um, <clears throat> next slide. This, this shows uh, Johansson himself um, uh, at work. And the next one is the skeleton of uh, Lucy, which he found in 1974 in Ethiopia. Uh, the Lucy skeleton is 3.2 million years old. She was bipedal and stood about three and a half foot high. She had a cranial capacity of about 400 uh, cc's, uh, compared with uh, 1,350 cc's for a modern human. Uh, next slide is the uh, is a uh, depiction of the hominid family tree as it is conceived at present. Um, this is from uh, Johansson's book. The oldest fossil which we um, have is um, believed to be, which we believe to be human, is the skull of the Salanothropus. Um, I, I may need help on my uh, pronunciation here, but that's this one. Uh, down at the bottom here, but unfortunately we only have the one skull and uh, it's dated, almost dated to between six and seven million years old. So it's very, that's very, very close to the um, time of the common ancestor of chimpanzees uh, and man. This is a time scale down the side here, uh, years ago, that's zero years ago, one, two, and so on down to six million years ago. And um, the next one in the line here is um, Ardipithecus ramidus. Uh, <coughs> and then a little later is Lucy, which is um, this um, skull here, Ardipithecus, um, sorry, no, it's not, it, this is, um, <coughs> what's it called? Um, Australopithecus afarensis. And then all her various descendants. <coughs> there are robust descendants on this side over here. And then on the other side, the more gracile descendants, there's uh, Homo habilis, Homo agaster, uh, Homo erectus. And up here is, um, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time pronunciation, uh, pronouncing this one. It's um, Florence, Floresiensis, um, who lived in Indonesia and uh, not that very long ago, uh, was still alive, I think, uh, 85, was it 85,000 years ago? And um, so uh, <clears throat> this is the Hobbit, you know, been nicknamed the Hobbit. And then over on this side we have, um, um, Neanderthal. Actually, the first Neanderthal skull was discovered before Darwin published The Origin of Species, not long ahead of that. But it was already, no, but uh, it was still unclear um, what it was all about. So the Neanderthals are up at the top, and then at the very uh, top of, uh, over here we have our own uh, group, the Homo uh, sapiens. Martin, in paper recently there was 
Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 Y
um, the uh, the feet could grasp uh, trees and so on, so I could climb and help it climbing trees. <coughs> so uh, we're seeing a rather different uh, creature from what was uh, what had been imagined up until that time. Until that time, um, people thought that uh, uh, surely something that close to the uh, common ancestor with with uh, chimpanzees would be a lot more like chimpanzees. But in fact, this is really quite like human sort of characteristics. So now the viewpoint is that the common ancestor was much more human-like than we have believed hitherto. Um, and um, perhaps the chimpanzees have done quite a bit of evolving all of their own. You see, they, the, the chimpanzees have evolved um, much more uh, uh, curvature in the hands and the fingers, and um, uh, they still rely on knuckle walking and things like this, which, um, which are not actually seen in Ardipithecus. So uh, Ardipithecus, um, nearly uh, six million years ago, is is uh, uh, much more human-like than uh, had been imagined up until now. So all of this goes to show that um, Darwin's work, you know, is still um, very much uh, in the front. And some of the things that he got into and the lines of investigation that he started are still being pursued. Do they have any uh, evidence of tool making and so forth? Sorry? Do you find for tool making or tool making or anything of that nature with, with this new one? Do they have any evidence of tool making? Um, they making tools. Oh, tools? Um, I don't I didn't remember seeing anything. Did you? No, no? there is no. The, the earliest no. tool making comes from about 2.6 million years ago. With the form of Homo habilis. Uh, and uh, then we have explosion of tools uh, about two million and uh, later on. Okay, Australopithe I mean Neanderthal was using very sophisticated tools made of uh, stone, made of uh, bone, uh, needles and things like this. Uh, was able to stitch some clothes or something like this. So, but that was much later. It was about uh, eighty thousand, uh, one hundred thousand years ago. Well, how, far, how far back did chimpanzees Ah, chimpanzees, yeah, but chimpanzees don't make tools. They use uh, objects as they tools. They use the tools, but they don't make them. Right, them, yeah. yeah, they use objects like stones or sticks and so forth. But here we are talking about tools, uh, 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 stones which were somehow uh, prepared for, for tools. Do you want to tell us about your skull or do you want to? Well, this is the skull of Lucy, which goes back oh, to Lucy. many years oh. ago. Wow. <coughs> and I have the original issue of the science magazine about this Antipinacus radicus. So if you want to look at the original articles, uh, you can look at the Mary, don't the chips uh, strip some of the things they stick yes. down in the animals? Yes, they do. Well, that's a modification. <laughs> not like, well, not, not like flaking stones, though. Uh, uh, yeah, probably the case that a Neanderthal lost. Tools weren't quite as as elegant as the Clovis points and stuff like no, that. No, of course. They, yes. Now, Bob, back to the uh, uh, to the home. They show three billiard balls on that table, mm -hmm. but they also have pockets. Billiard tables don't have pockets. I say that's a snooker table. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, you can see that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, they had a real nice electric light show over the top of the I'm pretty sure that that, that billiard table probably didn't come that way. What did they use? What did they use? Were they, this was being in the middle of the 19th century. Was that thing originally equipped with candles? 
Or did they use kerosene lanterns by then? Yes. And that was going to be the next question. <laughs> when did the gas come? I would have been answered. I don't know. It's rather late in the 19th century. No, 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 no. Tell us, Bob, how far, how far can you remember back when they had gas? Oh, 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 uh, 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 did Charles did, did he live on inherited wealth? So I uh, yeah, inherited. I guess so. The, um, the, the family were pretty well to do by the time Charles came along. Partly because of the uh, Whitewood connection, you see. But also the, the grandfather and father were, were very good physicians. Do very well through that. I didn't see where he was earning any money. Have you got that one? Trip around the world. Um, I, I, I didn't mention anything like that. You know, was, uh, I suppose he must have made some money in royalties from the book because the book was quite a uh, sold pretty well. The origin of the book did you? The one major boat was held up though until 20 years later or something. Yeah, the uh, Voyage of the Beagle was uh, earlier. And um, so I imagine he made some money from that, but I don't really know for sure. Uh, didn't the Wedgwood and the Hudson Bay Company have some kind of Well, the, the Wedgwoods and the Darwins, I know, uh, had their own in the marriage, but I don't think the uh, Huxleys were... There was something in the news about a couple of years ago about them. those three families. They thought they were superior, and they only you know, they, they married each other for several, three generations. The third generation, they had many, many birth problems. Yeah. Uh, of course, there were several uh, Huxley descendants who were very uh, prominent in one way or another. Was, uh, Julian, Julian Huxley was Julian Huxley was uh, a professor at Rice University in first hand, and they they recruited him. You know, they wanted some big names to uh, put on the faculty now. So they recruited Julian, uh, but Julian, and Julian had. Uh, famous brother or uh, cousin, Aldous Huxley, who uh, bad brother. <laughs> that was a bad boy. <laughs> did she go to Cambridge? Or did you just visit Cambridge? <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't understand what you said. You said you, did you attend Cambridge University or did no. you just visit there? No. Uh, um, <coughs> um, Charles was a student at, at uh, Cambridge. Christ College in Cambridge. But I went to Imperial College, London. Oh, okay. yeah. I thought you said you, maybe you just had been to the school itself in Cambridge. Well, we have visited, we visited uh, there, but um, uh, just just yeah. tourists. I wasn't a student. I, I do understand. Uh, I like to comment that Darwin was not an academic mission. He was, he was really an amateur as far as getting a professorial or something like that. Not attached to a university. And that some great findings have been made by those recently who are not academicians. The intralocular lens implant, which a lot of you have now, inserted in your eyes after cataract surgery, was devised, originated, and perfected by non-academicians uh, in ophthalmology. Yeah, well, that, that's true. I mean, there are, there, is, uh, there are brains outside of the universities as well. <laughs> 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 they may have done a clinical, clinical professor, but not full-time salary professor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand that at all. Darwin's father was trying to sabotage his his uh, chance to go on that trip. He had uh, Darwin required permission from his father to get the funding 
to to uh, uh, accompany the Fitzroy on the Beagle, and then also when he was on the he finally got permission to go, he got in trouble with Fitzroy because when he was on the mountain showing Fitzroy the fossils of the mountain, and he was basically saying that you know these things are pretty much evidence that the biblical chronology is wrong. Fitzroy didn't like that at all. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, yeah, the, if you read the voyage of the Beagle, it's very fascinating. And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, Robert Darwin, the, the father, did not want to do this. Yeah, he, there was another guy that was asking that was uh, willing to fund Darwin, but he told uh, Charles that, that I have to get your father's permission in order to do this, and if he doesn't give me, give, give me his permission, then I can't do anything. Well, I, I think he was, I, I, from what I remember, he was turned around on it, you know, eventually. Yeah. That he he uh, began to see that since uh, Charles was so enthusiastic about it, that you know maybe he maybe he'd learn something, you know, out of it, and uh, something good might come of it. But he wasn't. He didn't like the idea of the start. Well, that's another thing that I was kind of interested in. Is the, the I didn't really understand at first how how supportive his wife was of his efforts, and that she was very very, uh, how should I say, enthusiastically involved with him in the project. And I thought it was the, from the first impressions I got of the situation that she was religious and that she was reluctant to agree with him on anything. It sounded like kind of a marriage of convenience, but, but these, uh, they, they had a thing I saw on PBS showed that, that she was really very uh, closely involved with him and also in respect yeah. to the publishing of his yeah, book. Yeah, she had encouraged him to publish well before that 20 year gap. Yeah, she, she, did, she realized the implications, but still mm -hmm. felt that what he had found was important enough that he should publish well before that 20 years before he did. So she was very supportive of yeah. him. I read recently most of the Descent of Man, and I was really struck at what a fine, clear, lucid <coughs> writer he is. Uh, unlike many modern uh, texts, he doesn't use big words, it's simple, and his thoughts are very clear, and it's a beautiful read. I would recommend it if y'all haven't, haven't read Darwin himself recently. He <coughs> did a lot of uh, editing there, you see. Um, copies of the, of the manuscript, there's a lot of crossings out, and additions, and deletions, and so on. And many of his observations, you know, really are current. They, it's not 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 anything in there. I think it really is obsolete. Or, or yeah, severely contradicted that question. Well, he was very careful not to jump to conclusions if he, you know if he could avoid it. He could uh, be very uh, cautious in claims as as to what things meant, and uh, he you know he amassed a, he amassed a huge amount of data in, in effect to back up the contentions in, in the article. That was so cool. This, might, this goes along with the topic, I guess it could be germane. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, and I mentioned to some people already, Richard Dawkins has a new book on the market now. It's called The, uh, the Greatest Show on Earth. Yeah. I think the first chapter really What's it, what's it about? What's it about? And, uh, it's, and the first chapter, he talks about the uh, it's titled, the title of the first chapter is It's Only a Theory. It might give you an idea of what he, he compare, he brings up an analogy comparing uh, teaching creationism in science classes uh, to teaching the Holocaust denial in history classes. <laughs> it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a book on evolution that's written for the lay person. Is that what you got out of it, David? Uh, probably. It's, uh, I think it does a damn good what job. That first chapter is really excellent as far as is delineating the difference between the scientific explanation of a theory as opposed to the layman's explanation or the creationist explanation of a theory. Now that's what I was going to ask, and and is the, the contemporaries to Darwin when he first came out with the theory of evolution, did uh, were there other scientists that tried to uh, shoot this down on a scientific basis, or was it strictly the religious aspect of it? I think it was the religious 
side well, plates that will do us some social trouble. I mean, already, um, you know, the, the age of the Earth was understood to be much greater than 4,000 years. years. <laughs> uh, and uh, already there were a lot of people who have, have got bits and pieces of the evolutionary story, you see. And so I think uh, it wasn't uh, was that revolutionary in a sense. Yeah, was Mendel in Germany a contemporary of Darwin, or was he some time later? Who? The, the Mendel? Mendel, I think. Is a, yeah, the, Mendel, the I don't remember the dates, but um, you know, he was doing his work, I, I believe, uh, in uh, no, 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 contemporary with Darwin. Contemporary. And um, there's a quite a bit of discussion about how much, if anything, Darwin knew about it. The, um, the feeling is that uh, he was aware of it. He was aware of Mendel's work, but didn't really see the relevance of it. He didn't really uh, connect it up in a, a way that it finally was, was seen to be. Was Mendel aware of Darwin? Uh, well, how is Mendel's work regarded in, in the scientific? Uh, it would seem to me like he was really working on evolution, just only on a shorter period of time, and maybe he didn't. Mendel? Yeah, maybe he didn't really uh, uh, either understand what he was doing, or or maybe he just didn't describe it that way. I mean. Well, you know, I'm wrong, I mean, let me say this, I'm, I'm no expert on uh, biology or uh, paleo uh, studies. Um, yeah, you know, Mary, but you know, you got the answers. I have something. The, um, uh, see, the question was more than Mendel now, right? Yeah. My impression is, and I really have to go and, you know, look in books to, verify it. But my impression was that he didn't really know very much or, 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 or work very much as regards evolution. I mean, what he was interested in was, you know, the, the inheritance of certain characteristics by, uh, particularly in, in plants, you know, and he did all these uh, cross-breeding experiments with uh, peas and uh, other plants and, and looked at the, the uh, certain particular characteristics and show how, you know, there were certain characteristics that had real um, close definition that were inherited in one way or another way. I guess the question I would have to ask is, did Mendel have any uh, musings in his mind as to the implications of his work that it might be germane to what Darwin was doing? I, I don't think so, but I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think these things didn't really come out until uh, after the uh, after 1900, when people started going together, the set of man was published ten years after Origin of Species, and in it, Darwin refers frequently to other biologists and other scientists to justify some of his observations, and it makes me feel that if he had been aware of Mendel. Mendel was after Darwin, I think. I don't know. He would have possibly referred to him. And of course, Mendel was a monk, and he had no interest in incurring the wrath of the Catholic Church. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Yeah. 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 Mendel published his uh, article about the inheritance of those traits in the, in the peace in an obscure journal. I don't remember now the title, but it was an obscure local journal very few people was, were reading it. And uh, later on, when in 1900s, uh, they were looking for the uh, record of his publication, if I'm not mistaken, okay, now, Bob, I may be mistaken, uh, they found uncut issue in Darwin's library of this publication, but it was uncut. What it means, he never read it. And he never mentioned in his uh, publications, as you mentioned, uh, that he quoted many scientists, never Mendel was mentioned, mentioned in it. So, uh, obviously, Mendel was absolutely forgotten, not known. Only in the beginning of the 20th century, those modern, you know, uh, 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 
uh, geneticists, okay, which were trying to study chromosomes and, and so on, they found out by probably by chance th these articles by Mendel. Okay. So it was forgotten in the, in the history. Okay. Yeah, Mendel was essentially just inheritance factors. Right. That's what he was hammering. And uh, whereas what Darren is doing with those beaks, he's after morphology, so it's a long time before we start building uh, phylogenetic trees on DNA. It's a long time. So kind of, Mendel's work was important for the inheritance factor, but you know, to try to blend them together, I, there's nothing out there for that. I mean, it was really, uh, was really uh, into the, well into the uh, 20th century before people really began to see the link between the two lines of investigation. Um, you know, there's the, um, uh, Julian Huxley uh, uh, is credited with producing the, um, the, the uh, what, what do they call it, the, um, the link between the two, uh, the, the synthesis, the grand synthesis or something like that, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I always have Julian Huxley and, and muscle physiology in my head, but, uh, so, so. but there's another Huxley in there that, yeah. That, uh, the, the Julian, Julian Huxley uh, uh, wrote some books and, and did some work on Andrew, the, the synthesis Andrew, of uh, these things, which? Andrew, wasn't there an Andrew Huxley about the same time? And Elvis, Julian, and there was, a, there was another Huxley in there. <laughs> yeah, there were lots of Huxleys. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Julian Huxley um, uh, wrote a, a book in some, sometime like 1946, you know, or 1944, sometime like that, that, that explained how the knowledge of genetics and uh, the knowledge of uh, paleontology could be linked together, you know, into one unified theory of evolution. <coughs> and uh, it was so, called something like the uh, synthesis, or the grand or synthesis, yeah, or grand something synthesis like that. Right. And, well, when, uh, uh, when's DNA? Forty-six is just the well, bank of time is becoming. Still recognized as the uh, the inheritable factor and I yeah. think that's maybe about that time. Yeah, it's about four yeah. yeah. uh, Is it four before four the four war ended? I thought it was a little bit after. Four, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's in the same book. Yes. Yeah. So it was understood that DNA was the, uh, the, the likely transmitter of uh, heredity, but it wasn't um, until Watson and Craig that we understood how right. it worked. Yeah. You see, yeah. It was a big mystery for a while as to how it, how it managed to work. So, uh, it, was, it was quite a detective story altogether. More of a detective story than I was prepared to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there knowledge of DNA prior to Watson and Crick? <laughs> yeah, there was knowledge of, uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, how, of the structure of the molecule. Mm -hmm. And things like this. And they were able to identify the chemical composition. But well, they, you know, they, had, they knew the chemical composition, uh, composition, but they didn't know how it was structured. Yeah. I think that was the key problem. And it was Watson and Crick who realized that it was on this, uh, you know, cylindrical uh, yeah, he uh, helix, double helix thing. And that was their contribution. Has, has anyone here heard about the intelligent design movement people opening up what they call creation museums, where supposedly oh, they, oh, yeah. they show the bones and everything? I, I, was, I have an interesting article that it was sent to me that I found somewhere. Uh, it's atheist reports. I don't know if he was a scientist, but he was an atheist. And he visited one uh, large museum. I think it was Washington, D.C. It was one in Kentucky. He said it was like, no, it's, it's the creation museum is in, oh, one of them anyways, is in Kentucky. Okay, I don't know yeah. which one it was, yeah, but anyway. For us, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, he said it was a joke because when you go in there, they have all these rules that say you cannot ask questions or discuss anything. You must show reverence or something like that. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? I have an article on it. I don't think anybody wants to read it. It's funny stuff. It's very real, too, in some way. But there's a beautiful production. 
they, they got plenty of money to employ yeah. the best model makers. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's something like 30 so they try to you know, come up with what you know, similar science. Yeah. 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 I mean, Christianity is Christianity. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a good segue to my question. Um, we know Lucy, um, speaking of museums, I'm sorry, uh, Lucy's traveled, traveled the world. Um, is there going to be an Artie expedition? Do you know? It's not going to be a, a, an Artie expedition. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. There was a very nice uh, exhibit of uh, Lucy, of course, in right. Houston here. Right. And uh, that, was, uh, that was very interesting. They made a big pitch about this having been discovered in Ethiopia, you know, a lot of it, it had a lot of information on Ethiopia, and partly an exhibit about Ethiopia, and then, you know, there's a sort of an afterthought, oh, by the way, we discovered Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, okay, it was a, a fun. So what year did they find Lucy, and what year did they find Artie? Lucy was found in 1742, I think. 74. 74, and Artie was like 20 years later than that. 94. And they first discovered one tooth, or a, a jawbone with one tooth. And that's all I had for a while. And uh, uh, they, they went back to the same area uh, several times, you know, before they finally discovered enough of a skeleton to, uh, to really depict this uh, creature. When did they discover the Laetoli footprints? When? I don't, I don't remember that. Uh, it was in Asia. I think it was found in Kenya? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tanzania. Tanzania? Yeah. Okay. Well, it was on a plane. It was, what it was was it buried by volcanic yeah. ash and then the weather uh, eventually eroded away that ash and its footprints were exposed. Yeah. And they found that they were inline footprints. But they, just, yeah. they dated them when it was like three million years old. So yeah. 3.7. Okay. They reckon to be uh, Australopithecus. Same species of Lewis. Yeah. You know, Johansson was looking at them and he said that they were human to him. Were they looking? Yeah. 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 Well, they were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't almost seeing it. No, of course not. <laughs> they recently found some dinosaur footprints that were like five feet across. They said, uh, yeah, I saw those. Good feet. Yes. Are we finding human prints next to them? Well, that's, yeah. that's, right that's the one in Glen Rose, right? Yeah. Well, that's now, one of my, you know, I'm an engineer, and one of my pet uh, peeves is that um, the um, biologists have sort of uh, appropriated the uh, idea of evolution entirely to themselves. I haven't read. <laughs> uh, they don't remember, or that they frequently do not remember that evolution occurs in all sorts of other areas. Um, uh, all sorts of tools and uh, systems that we use are um, produced by evolution. You know, we, we, we make a thing, we discover there's problems with it, so we modify it. The next generation of the thing comes out. You know, each year there's a, uh, a redesign of the automobile. So you um, uh, you evolve uh, things over time. The Bible has evolved that way. Huh? The Bible has also evolved. Oh yes. <laughs> doesn't doesn't medical science kind of depend upon evil. evolution as a fundamental idea? Well, yeah, I think uh, that that's a good point that. Uh, Especially um, the um, bacteria and so on go through many generations much faster than uh, the, the larger organisms. Therefore, there is uh, evolution of things like flu. The flu. Uh, uh, the Christians will say that that's microevolution, but but the Christians will deny that macroevolution happens. That that new species actually occur. From the, as products of evolution. Well, that's a sort of uh, fallback position. Yeah. That, you know, if, if the, the people are sort of uh, backed up against the wall, they have to 
Well, well I mean, you can also ask, okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
still have some refreshments left and some soda, so please help yourselves. And um, we're glad to see everybody. I see some new faces. That's always good. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> 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 